you're ready. So uh, let me begin by thanking uh, the organizers and uh, uh, the others for inviting me to this wonderful uh, conference. It's a really beautiful place to be. Uh, so today I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, some work in progress um, with the student environment GIF or the big thing. And so the title would be Canonical Verification and the Common Extreme Shop. So as we go along, I'll explain some of the job. Okay. So to start with, let's consider a, a general uh, full bank by quadrate stage. Um, psi in the tensor product of uh, two Hilbert spaces each left times each R. Um, for the moment, we can consider these Hilbert spaces to be finite dimensional. That, that's uh, the setting I'll try to work with for the first at least for the most of the talk. But uh, we can talk about how to generalize them. Uh, and by full rank here, I mean all of these. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll say what I mean by full rank. But you know, any such state can be written uh, in a Schmidt decomposition, a constant which is called Schmidt decomposition, where you write the state psi uh, as some diagonal product uh, between a set of basis states, chi tilde on the left and chi on the right. Uh, so the numbers uh, pn, which appear in this expansion, are essentially the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrices of the state on the side. Uh, and you can think of the chi's and the chi tildes as being the eigenstates of the uh, reduced density matrices on the matrices. Um, and just, I guess, we, we notice that while the eigenvalues are common to the two sides, the eigenstates are common. Okay. Um, now, on the other hand, if I only gave you access to one side of the state, Let's say if I only gave you access to the left side, the left party, or in, in other words, the reduced density matrix of the state on the left, uh, then you could write down a, a purification. Uh, in fact, the canonical purification, it's canonical in a sense which, which means you know, it's sort of uniquely picked out. Well, there are many you know, purifications, of course, but this one is canonical in a certain sense, um, which is uh, the following. I'm going to denote the canonical purification of the state side. Uh, as psi star, and psi star is basically, you know, you, the eigenvalues uh, are, are, of course, known from the reduced density matrix on the left. And, you know, since you know the reduced density matrix on the left, you also know the sort of eigenstates on the left. Uh, but on the right, you simply put, uh, roughly speaking, the same states. Okay? Instead of having the, you know, in the, full, in the state that was given to you, there were some other eigenstates on the right side. But here, since you don't have access to the reduced density matrix on the right, you could simply decide to do uh, something simple-minded, which is just put the same set of states on the other side. And you know, to make it uh, unambiguous, what you usually do is you uh, act on these with some anti-unity operator. So that essentially phases are not ambiguous. Um, so this, this purification uh, of the left um, density matrix is often called the canonical purification. And you know you, you might notice that this sort of reminds one or it resembles the normal field double state. Um, and you could think of this canonical purification psi star as being in some sense the simplest purification that you could build, uh, given only access to the left to the left. Now since psi and psi star are just two different purifications of the same state, uh, or the same same density matrix uh, from the left side. Uh, they ought to be related by a unitary transformation on the right. Uh, and I'm going to call this unitary transformation curly R. Uh, so the, the curly thing, I've written an explicit form for curly R in terms of the Schmidt bases and the, uh, the Schmidt bases on the two sides that I introduced previously. Uh, but you know, the way I presented it here, it's sort of defined more invariant. It's, it's a unitary operator which acts only on the right and maps psi to its canonical purification from the left. And one should note that you know R, this this uh, unitary operator, sort of goes beyond uh, entanglement, so, you know, simple entanglement measures uh, in defining the properties of psi, essentially because psi and psi star have the same entanglement metrics, or any entanglement. They both have the same entanglement spectrum. Uh, so if you like the, you know, you can think of R psi, this, this operator, as uh, quantifying in some sense how complex the original state psi was, 
uh, you know, to reconstruct from a simple a simple verification, like a canonical verification. Okay. Uh, in that sense, it goes beyond entanglement in quantifying the properties of the state side. And I, if, I'm going to call this operator the reflection operator. The name is still work in progress. This, this whole talk is work in progress, but the name is particularly work in progress. So if, you have better, if you have suggestions for better names for this thing, uh, uh, please do that. Okay, so I'm going to call this thing the reflection operator. So let me give you a few uh, motivations for why I might want to study the reflection operator. Um, eventually, I'll settle on one particular motivation, but uh, just more broadly speaking for now, uh, you know, in holographic CFTs, uh, it was shown by Harlow that uh, a sort of a consequence of the Lindner kinetic formula is that the encoding of bulk degrees of freedom into the boundary uh, follows uh, some, it, it is, in a sense, in a sense, a quantum error correcting code. And the, the nature of the mapping is as follows. Uh, you, you, some semi-classical state of the bulk means which I'm denoting I bulk, subscript bulk, gets mapped into the CRT number space in this particular way. Um, and so sort of, th there is this unitary operator U sub A which appears uh, in this discussion. So A here is uh, some boundary subregion in the CRT and I is a bulk degree of freedom in the entanglement event of that boundary subregion. Um, so there is this unitary operator U which appears in Harlow's construction um, just which is sort of a general consequence of the RT formula, but you can naturally think of that unitary operator as a reflection operator. Okay? So in order to see that, what you have to do is you construct this maximally entangled state of your own subspace with some, you introduce a reference uh, subspace which is isomorphic to the code subspace and you build this maximally entangled state. And then it's not too hard to show that, you know, what Harlow calls this U, this unitary operator U which appears in Harlow's story. It's precisely a reflection operator with respect to this particular bipartition in the A and reference A bar. Okay, so in, in that sense, the, the, this reflection operator finds some natural role uh, in the language of in, in, in this uh, framework of trying to fit ADS CFT into one error correction. Now, a second motivation comes from the fact that there is this interesting quantity called the reflected entropy, uh, which was defined and studied uh, in this paper by Tata and Sokna. And the reflected entropy is defined as follows. Given a, a mixed state on two parties row AB, one defines the reflected entropy as the entanglement. So first of all, one constructs the canonical clarification of row AB. I'm going to call that psi star AB, A star, B star. Okay. And then one computes the entanglement entropy in this canonical clarification for the subset KP star. Okay. This is what's called the reflected entropy, and in, as explained in this beautiful paper, uh, the reflected entropy finds a natural geometric interpretation uh, in ADS CFT in terms of uh, the, in terms of what is called the entanglement wedge cross section. So if one looks at the entanglement wedge of AP and the cross sectional area of that thing uh, computes the reflected entropy. So this is another reason to maybe interested may uh, be interested in the reflection operator. And finally, as a... Finally, as you mean, so the entanglement wedge is one dimension more, right? So does okay. it have an area? So, so uh, or you just meant the constant time slice of the wedge? Or? Correct. So you look at the... Uh, you look at the... And so, so maybe I just quickly draw a picture. So for example, you know, the simplest, the simplest setting, uh, let's say, uh, but is it not to be at a fixed time? Yeah, it's not here. Here, here you do not have the whole dynamical setup. So correct, entang correct, correct. Entanglement it's which is maybe a little bit over here to basically mean causal which. I mean, that, I, mean, I, mean uh, exactly. I mean, the time slice. Time slice. That's that's right. But just to keep people interested in the picture, uh, so here's here's a mixed state AP, right? Uh, if you if you just take the relief entity matrix on AP. Uh, then that's a mixed state, and the entanglement wedge, if these, these two subregions are sufficiently fixed, the entanglement wedge of AB is connected, and then you know the cross section of that is looks like this. 
and, and the claim of this paper is that the reflected energy, this thing, up to a factor of two, is the reflected energy. So if you take two regions, like one on one side and the other on the other side, so that you don't have a connected bed, yeah. smaller, then the cross section is zero. Yeah. So reflected and cross yeah. is zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. And finally, a third motivation uh, comes from the fact that uh, you know it was argued in this recent paper of Engelhardt and Folkstar uh, um, that in the context of a of an evaporating black hole, an old evaporating black hole. Uh, the canonical purification of the state with respect to the black hole side uh, actually has a connected bulk geometry to it. Okay, the original evaporating black hole, there's no, there's no wormhole inside. Okay. Um, but if you look at the canonical purification of that state, uh, then these people argue that the bulk geometry that corresponds to that uh, necessarily has a connected wormhole. Okay, so in some sense, realizing the idea of ER equals to ER in that context. So, you know, the, since the state is mapped to, the, this reflection operator is the thing that maps the state to its canonical clarification, you could think of this reflection operator in that case as sort of geomet geometrizing the entanglement in the originally complex state uh, into something that has a smooth cross geometry, a connected cross geometry. Okay, so those were a few of the motivations uh, for why you might be interested in studying uh, the reflection operator. But here, in, in this talk, I'm going to sort of uh, focus on one uh, particular one. Maybe that, uh, you know, there's a very nice description or proposal due to Engelhardt and Wall uh, for what the Lorentzian geometry dual to a canonical, to the canonical purification is supposed to be. Okay? The idea is that you, uh, since you only have access to the, in, in building the canonical purification, since you only have access to the left side, well, from the bulk point of view, what you could do is you could consider the entanglement bench of the left in the original, in the geometry that's original, dual to the original state side. And, you know, the construction of the canonical purification, roughly speaking, is just doubling the space and putting the same set of eigenstates on the other side. So, a natural prescription would be to just double the entanglement bench, take two copies of the entanglement bench, and glue them together up to a CPT you to sort of reflect one of the copies by a CPT transformation and glue them together at the at the quantum extreme of the So this was a proposal due to uh, angular part of the wall. Now, you know, when you glue regions of space-time together in general relativity, that's not completely unconstrained. You need to satisfy a set of constraints where space, regions of space-time are glued. These are uh, in the co-dimension one context. These are the famous uh, Israel tension conditions. Uh, so here we have a gluing across four dimension two surface, namely the quantum extremal surface of the bulk. But Engelhardt and Wall show that uh, <coughs> you can derive starting from the co dimension one constraints and applying them to the two null sheets uh, in this uh, construction, you can derive a set of four dimension two junction conditions uh, that the gluing of these two regions has to satisfy. Uh, in order for the resulting space time to satisfy its time Okay? So, what I mean by that is when you glue these two regions of space time together, you have a Cauchy slice that passes through it. There's the blue line that I tried to indicate here. And, you know, so you, you take the data on this Cauchy slice and you evolve them, evolve it forward and backward and using Einstein's equations. That is supposed to generate the full geometry, but for this to work, um, you need to have some set of constraint equations satisfied at the, at the point of the group. Very analogous to the Israel junction conditions. Okay. Now, when this quantum extremal surface is actually classically extremal, which is to say that it uh, uh, you know, extremizes the area, okay. uh, another way of saying that is that the expansions of the null, null geodesic congruences in the two directions are zero, but okay. The, more down to when the surface is classically extremal, uh, Engelhardt and Wall show that these junction conditions are trivially satisfied. Okay. However, uh, so sorry, yeah. uh, before you move on, yeah. just to make sure that, that I understand the construction here, can, can I view this as, a, a, as some sort of 
be make uh, some sort of a holographic construction of the what you were saying before of the thermal field bubble in yes. the sense that you uh, now you have gone from from a single boundary theory to two boundary theory okay. but, but they are correlated and they are connected to, through these Einstein uh, junction conditions. Correct, yes. Uh, but, but the probabilities are not necessarily the ones of the thermal field level, but they are... That's right. They are. That's right, that's right. And that's how, exactly. how do you determine those probabilities in this construction, or is this... So this construction gives you the bulk geometry, but then you can compute whatever you want. Okay. So you will want... Oh. So. Uh, yeah, so this construction gives you so you, you you take the conditions of the initial data, you evolve it backward and forward, that gives you the full geometry, yeah, then you can compute then, whatever conditions. That would be the part of the description. Yeah. But but if the junction if the boundary conditions at the junction were a little bit different as what you are going to do, this allows you to do more general things. Yeah. Uh, no, actually what I what I'm gonna so, say is something slightly different. Okay. But yeah. We we always impose the junction conditions that come from general level. Right. Yeah, nothing 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 more. But yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you, you might wonder what happens if you impose a different set of conditions. What is the boundary to rule of that? That's, that's a great question, but that's not what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any other? Okay. So, so what, I, what I was telling you was that in this, in, in the case where the, 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 surf, the, the bulk surface that you're viewing across is classically extremal, these junction conditions are kind of generally sensible. However, there's a catch here. Um, you know, in general, in a, in a context where the, 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 the quantum extremal surface is not classically extreme, mm -hmm. namely where you know the, the surface doesn't benefit, the, it doesn't extremize the area function, but the sum of the area functional plus a bulk entropy term. Um, in that context, uh, you can check that these junction conditions are not satisfied trivially, but they imply a certain structure for the bulk stress tensor. So they, they imply that there needs to be a delta function stress tensor supported uh, on the on the quantum, the quantum extremal surface. Okay, this is this, del this delta function shock, if you like, comes from requiring the Israel junction be satisfied. Um, the Israel junction conditions are expressed in terms of the expansions of the null geodesic congruences, and the quantum extremality condition relates these expansions to the derivatives. The bulk entropy. Um, so therefore, what you find is that um, sort of general relativity imposes upon you a constraint that you know this, this the space-time the dual that is dual to the canonical verification better be such that the state of the bulk matter uh, should have this delta function shock. Okay? Only in that case can you consistently satisfy semi-classical Einstein equation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, if there is no matter in the bulk, then um, presumably you can't violate this. So, you know, you, would, you won't have a, a QES which is not classically extreme. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at a situation where, where you have a QES which is not classically extreme. But why would you have a QES that is classically extreme? So, so you want, you're saying that in that case, QES will always be classically extreme. Yeah, yeah. But why would that be? Because uh, the description says that you have to. Look at the bulk entropy also. Yeah, but there is a bulk entropy So you, you're referring to graph terms? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then, then yeah, of course. So if then you think of the bulk entropy. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I thought we meant no bulk matter at all. So gravitons, I think. Yeah, gravitons. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and the support is only on that uh, only on that time slice or throughout the... Throughout. So they, the junction conditions of general relativity only which remind the constraints are only determined at the point, at the QES. Yeah. So general relativity tells you these constraints only from at the QES. But of course, they, these things will propagate, and yeah. in general, you'll get shocks on the full function. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So to, to reiterate, this is a constraint on the state of the bulk matter uh, in, the, in the bulk dual to the canonical clarification that is just enforced upon you by general relativity. Okay. And so the purpose of this talk will be to try and verify this prediction of the angle not wall description. Namely to see that if you if you try and compute the stress tensor of the bulk matter in the state that's dual to the canonical verification, uh, does it or does it not have this shock? 
uh, at the location of the final execution. Okay. So we are going to work, uh, at least for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to work to first order in perturbation theory around a well, a well established state, namely the thermal field double state, which is dual to the eternal black hole. And to first order in perturbation theory, we are going to show the presence of the shock. Actually, I think these arguments can be generalized to perturbations around any background. Uh, so they are more general than that. But you, we, we need to make some mind assumptions to do that. Uh, I might not uh, discuss that in this talk. Uh, so, but you know, concretely, I'll try to do this in perturbation theory around uh, the eternal black hole. And just one final comment before getting into the technical details is that uh, you know, the Engelhardt world prediction essentially follows, uh, you know, follows from the Einstein equation. Right, it follows from Einstein's equation from above. And what we're going to be seeing here is the, if you like, the emergence of the bulk Einstein equation um, in, from the boundary point of view, from the boundary and time of the structure, uh, in a context where quantum corrections are important. Okay, so here we are, in a sense, crucially after the quantum corrections of the bulk, because those are the ones which give rise to this um, uh, quantum extremal shock. Okay? So any, any questions before we get into the technical details? Okay. So I hope the the motivation for, for the very annoying of this is clear. Um, now so so yeah, so so let's let's get into the weeds a little bit. Um, so let's let's say we have some one parameter family of states, which I'm going to call psi sub lambda. And uh, you know these are part are states in this bipartite type of space, uh, and I'm going to for simplicity consider full rank states, although that's not very important. Now, if any value of lambda, of course, we can construct the reduced density matrices go left and go right, corresponding to the left and right factor respectively. Okay. Accordingly, what we are going to have this one parameter family of modular Hamiltonians, a modular, modular Hamiltonian for a reduced density matrix go in the finite dimensional context, you can just think of it as being the log of the density matrix, okay? minus log of the density matrix. So we have a one parameter family of these modular Hamiltonians. Uh, and uh, in terms of the modular Hamiltonian, these uh, I, the, the modular eigenvalues and eigenstates that we talked about previously, of course, uh, satisfy these equations. So the first thing we'll try and do is, is we're, we're going to try and, and derive a differential equation uh, for this reflection optic uh, in terms of you know, more familiar things like the modular Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, essentially because the, yeah, the reflection optic has a simple expression in terms of the eigenstates, we can derive differential equations for the eigenstates in terms of the modular Hamiltonian. And so that's going to let us derive the flow equation in the for the reflection of it uh, as a function of this uh, parameter lambda. Okay. Now, upon an infinitesimal deformation of this parameter lambda, you know, the eigenstates of, let's say, you're working with the right modular Hamiltonian, uh, satisfies this equation. Okay. So here I'm assuming non degeneracy of eigenstates and so on. Um, but but here's, the, here's the differential equation. That these eigenstates satisfy. Now I can write this equation in the following way. What I choose to do is I choose to exponentiate uh, the denominator, the e n minus e m term in the denominator, by using a Schwinger parameter t. Okay. <coughs> and then what I do is see in the first line this m, the, the sum runs over all states m not equal to n. But of course I can I, I introduce some regulator. Uh, which I'm calling epsilon here, uh, to, to regulate this integral. And uh, that allows me to sort of add, add in by hand the m equals n term and subtract it. So here in this, in this part, what I, the first term, I've added in the m equals n term and then subtracted it out. Uh, just so that so the, the n, n equals n term, actually the integral divergence is the one over, one over epsilon divergence. Uh, but that, that's not to say that the, this expression has a divergence and you know, adding and subtracting the same thing on both sides. 
So the, the expression is actually quite well defined. It's just a way of rewriting. And the point of rewriting this in this way is that the second term is going to anyway drop out at the end of the day. Uh, so the expressions that we are going to finally come up with don't have anything to do with the divergent term. Uh, but it, it, this is just a convenient way, if you like, of rewriting uh, this differential equation. Okay? Uh, the point being that now this first term is entirely written in terms of the modular half. So we have these two differential equations uh, for the eigenstates on the left and the eigenstates on the right. In terms of um, some quantities which I define as curly A sub R and curly A sub L. So this little a and little, little a sub R and little a sub L are these diagonal parts. The, the last term there, which was one word, one word silent. Those I've just decided to call a sub little a sub r, a little a sub l, and everything else is the same. Okay. Just, a, just a way of reading. It is, so, as a, as a small detour perhaps, it is natural to interpret this curly a, uh, these, these, these two objects, curly a uh, sub left and curly a sub left, as connection one forms uh, on parameter space. Okay, so here I'm considering the special case of a one parameter family, but you could have considered a multi-parameter family, a manifold uh, parameters. In that, in that case, this, these A's become connection one forms on this parameter space. And you can think of them as to be connections on a, a bundle, which is the unitary group on the left times the unitary group on the right. So to see this, it's not too hard. What you do is you instead consider another state side prime which is just u times psi, where u is, let's say, a one-sided unitary acting, let's say, on r. And then you, you, know, you go back to the definitions of a, a left and a right, you plug that state in, and you see from a short computation that you know, the way that these a objects transform is that the left guy doesn't transform at all, not surprising, but the right guy transforms like a So you can think of these, so these um, you, you, uh, these objects have been introduced and studied in the literature. Um, you, they're sometimes called modular berry connections. Uh, and you know, uh, they've found interesting applications in several contexts. Uh, but it, you know, they're going to appear very naturally in our discussion. Anyway, that was a slight of bit of an aside. Um, but just going back to this reflection operator, we can now write down the flow equation for the reflection operator in terms of these connections. Okay, it's very simple. And uh, just, just to notice this A star is, is defined like, like so. The theta is the anti-unitary operator that has gone into the definition of the canonical variable. Okay, so it's a pretty simple differential equation in terms of these connections, and you can write down a relatively simple solution, uh, like so. Where, so here, um, th this is the solution of that differential equation uh, in terms of, so this, is, this, this solution tells you the reflection operator at some value of the parameter lambda in terms of the reflection operator at lambda equals zero in terms of conjugation by these path ordered exponentials uh, or these holonomies of the right uh, of the modular okay. as a As a non-important non, non comment, uh, these UL and UR are somewhat reminiscent of Franco cycles, flows, uh, but I'm not going to plan them out right now. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is this. So so far the discussion has been general. Uh, we've managed to write down, write down some flow equation um, for the reflection operator as a function of some parameter lambda. And now what we're going to do is we're going to try and specialize. Um, so we're going to we're going to specialize we're going to do perturbation theory, namely we are going to use this uh, to first order the map. Okay, expand around some state that we know well, uh, understand well, and then try to understand how the reflection operator changes in particular. Yeah. So what is that? That is the reflection operator at lambda equals zero. So lambda was just a general parameter, or is it a, uh, is it a, you know, the zero lambda equals zero point corresponds to the same. 
same set. That's, that's what I'm going to use. Okay. So in my specific context, that's going to be the case. At lambda equal zero, I'm going to have the term yeah, yeah. double state, yeah, which is its own phenomenal verification. So in that context, it's going to be one. I see. But more generally, so here it's completely yeah. It yeah. can be whatever it is. So, so you express as a solution once you know some uh, exactly. you need to know some other. Exactly. So you, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to work around the geometry where I say my known solution, okay. and then I perturb it. I see. And, uh, and one more question. Can this uh, correction be covered also? I mean, this uh, uh, it's, so, Yes, but the curvature only has to lie along like a subgroup. It has to lie if there if there are degeneracies mm -hmm. in the eigenspaces, then there can be curvature in that subspace. Uh, there can be you want to be whatever dimension very famous basically, but not not other. There's, other than that, there is no non part. Any other? All right, so as I, as I said, uh, so far the discussion was kind of general, uh, but now we are going to specialize to doing perturbation theory around a state which we understand well, namely the thermopyl top. Okay. So here, this is the lambda equal zero state, by zero. Uh, it's the thermopyl double state. In particular, it's a special feature, as others you pointed out, is that it's canonical verification is itself. Okay. So the R naught uh, is identical. Um, and I've just written it out in terms of the eigenstates and eigenvalues of some local Hamiltonian. Um, in particular, it's going to be important for me that this state can be realized as a Euclidean path integral. This is a well known statement, but let me just quickly should have drawn a picture. Uh, the Euclidean path integral on an interval like this of length beta over 2 uh, constructs. Uh, Constructs the state, uh, this thermopyl double state, uh, and that's going to that's going to play some role uh, in my discussion. Uh, good, but uh, essentially the, the canonical verification of the state as itself, except you know you you re relabel the left the right hand side in my convention, call it as one, but it's, it's the same state. Okay. Now we want to consider perturbations around the state. So I need to tell you what kind of perturbation. Take an aspect. Yes. Yes. As this is the uh, yeah. This I should have asked this in the beginning when you defined reflection, but you could also consider thermopyl state evolved on one side with some sure. and then this would not be true for that state. Yes, that's good. I see. Although in the bulk, that's as natural as considering the thermopyl. It's just look at a different time slice in the bulk. Um, just just cutting the bulk open. I mean, if you took that Euclidean path integral, you don't have to cut it on some that slice. You could cut a different slice, and it's the same state. Uh, it's not exactly the same state because it will have different uh, correlation functions. Yeah, so you cut it in a different slice, right? So yeah. now it's just but size. I think CPT determines the other yeah, slice. Yeah, okay. yeah, so instead of being psi of t, psi of minus t, it's psi of t, psi of minus t plus tau. So you, you want to move it on both sides or no, just on one side? You could move it on both sides because oh, with an isometry, it doesn't matter. So you could evolve the needle the IHL plus it. Those things don't matter because those phases will cancel out on both sides. Uh, no, no, not HL minus HL, HL plus HL. Oh, so if you move it with that, then that's a different state, and then it's not true that the canonical verification of that yes, state is not true. Right. Okay. okay. And uh, okay, but you won't have. Uh, okay. Oh, so you're asking whether we can repeat our calculations yes, yes, in yes, that yes, case? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I we haven't really thought about that, but excellent question. Maybe that's worth exploring. That's also, by the way, one parameter deformation of the original state. Sure. Interesting. Yes, that's an interesting. Um, yeah, so I, here I'm going to just expand around the thermopyl double state with no, no evolution, one side of Alright, so I have to tell you what kind of deformations of the thermopyl double I'm going to consider. And since I just told you that the thermopyl double state uh, is constructed from the Euclidean path integral, uh, one natural set of deformations that you might think about are you know, turning on sources in this Euclidean path. So this is very natural. Yes, here in context, uh, because of the the you know the Dubser Kelvin non positive coverage of the dictionary, if you like. Um, but it's like that's 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 what I'm going to do. I'm going to deform the Euclidean path integral by introducing some source, uh, which I'm calling J of tau. So here I've only written out the time integrals, the space, and this, you can also do this in space. The source can depend on space in interesting ways if you want. 
And this is for simplicity, not writing the space bar of the Okay, mm -hmm. and the parameter lambda is just the overall permission. Uh, o of tau for now is a general operator, but later on we will specialize into something that is relevant. Um, so this this new part of the now cons constructs a new bipartite state, which I'm going to call psi sub lambda. Okay, and we are interested in understanding, if you like, the canonical verification of this new state, or equivalently the reflection of it for this new state, psi lambda, psi sub. Lambda. Now, at, you know, from the expression, the flow equation that we derive for the reflection operator crucially has these modular Berry connections, and these Berry connections, this, from this expression, essentially rely on the modular right? up to this diagonal part, which is not going to be important. Um, if you knew the, if you knew how the modular Hamiltonian flows uh, along this flow, right, you could construct these Berry connections and connections and then you could construct the reflection of it. Okay. So what I need to know crucially then is I need to know uh, how the modular Hamiltonian flows along this definition. Um, and fortunately for us we do know how the modular Hamiltonian flows in this context. Um, it's given so let me first tell you the, the, the formula for it and I'll justify it in the next slide. Uh, but this is the formula for how for the first derivative of the modular Hamiltonian uh, along this okay. Let, I'm just writing the right side in this case. As an analogous formula also applies on the left side. Okay. Uh, the, the one novel feature in this formula is that there's a new integral that is appeared in this expression, namely this integral over this parameter s, which you can think of as taking this operator O and so it's evolving it in real modular. Okay. It's no longer a Euclidean operator. It's now a, 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 a Lorentzian operator. It's, a, it's been evolved in real modular modular time with respect to the modular Hamiltonian of the lambda equals zero state. So in our context, of course, the lambda equals zero state is the form of the double state. The modular Hamiltonian on the right side is the, the standard Hamiltonian. Uh, and so this is a real time operator. This, this just, as I, I'll explain where this new integral comes from, uh, but also notice that there's some there's some curve, there's some uh, the sin squared of uh, s over two which appears uh, in this expression. Um, I also introduced some there's the, there's the source j sub r, uh, which is essentially you know the same thing as the source that I introduced in the Euclidean path integral, but it's the time symmetrized version. Okay, so that the source that I introduced before was only on the lower half, from tau going from zero to minus beta over two. This J sub R is just the symmetrization of that, time symmetrization, time reflection. It's a metric version uh, of that. So I can put O was say that again. Do you remind me again for O? Yes, yes. So I'm considering deformations of the thermophile W. It's yeah, just called J O. Okay. O yes. is just the operator. Yeah, so O is the source that the operator of how so with which your question is both O and the source. Uh, that's right. Yes. That's right. Yes, and in, indeed, the, the source is integrated over in Euclidean time, and the op, but the operator is off and real time. That's the that's the structure of this. Okay, and as you can of course write down a similar formula for the left side. I'm not going to bother to do that. Uh, but so let me just quickly justify for you where this comes from. Now, where this comes from is the fact that you know, you're trying to take the derivative of the log of okay. and. Uh, that's not completely trivial because uh, n. So if you have a matrix rho and you know its derivative d, d rho by d lambda, they don't commute with each other, right? So when when you're trying to take the log of the derivative of the log of a matrix, you have to sort of expand out in all relevant terms using the baker campbell house formula. And in, it turns out that the linear order in lambda, namely if you're just considering the first derivative of log rho. You can resum that expansion. You can resum all the terms that are relevant in that expansion uh, and write the derivative of the log of the matrix uh, in this form. Okay, th this is where the sin squared and the integral over this S parameter comes in. The integral basically resums uh, uh, an infinite set of terms in the PCH one. Okay. 
And of course, this row to the IS and row to the minus IS is the same modular flow that we have seen in our previous expression. And finally, we also know that because the deformation, the deformation of the density matrix zero by d lambda is just turning on some source in the Euclidean path integral, you know, the, we know that we know what that is. We know that d over d lambda is just integral j tau. Okay. So you just take these two and you put, put them together, and that's where. Yes. Is some formula like this known for the second derivative of KR? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can write down all possible derivatives. Okay. I can give you a reference later. Uh, yeah, but here I'm going to just need the first. Okay. So that's uh, so we know what the first derivative of the modular Hamiltonian is, um, and so now you know because. Because we know the first derivative, the, the modular Berry connection evaluated at lambda <coughs> is still precisely depends on this first derivative of the modular Hamiltonian. So we simply plug that expression in here. And that gives us a formula, if you like, for the, this, you know, the, actually, uh, so, so this reflection operator had these two unit, these two unitaries, U, L, and U, R acting on sides of R0. So we now know what the first derivative of these two energy is. That's what we worked out so far. Uh, yeah, so this is the same view on the right hand side. Uh, so this, give, this gives a pretty explicit expression up to this diagonal part, which as I repeatedly say is not important. You'll see that in a few slides. Uh, up to that diagonal part, we have a pretty explicit expression um, for how the how these two matrices change, and so we also have a pretty explicit expression for how the reflection operator changes. As a side comment, uh, you know, you can use this expression to derive a sort of gravitational formula for the modular Berry connection, uh, but uh, I'm not going to explain that here. Uh, if we, can, we, we can talk later on if you're interested. Can I actually ask you a question? Sure. Now that you made it on, is there a relation between the notion of complexity, which you mentioned in the introduction, and the Berry curvature. So, not are uh, they related? Are they somehow related? In a sense, in a sense. So, you could, you know, the, the what is, so, <coughs> not not a direct one, but in the in, in the following sense, so these these unitaries are generated by these that Berry connections. They're, they're sort of parallel transport along these uh, very connections, modular very connections. And you know, when you talk about the complexity of a unitary, you sort of mean, uh, well, I, for, for example, you might mean the Nielsen complexity of a unitary or something like that. <laughs> what is the simplest or what is the shortest possible geodesic um, uh, to, to this unitary that you can find? Um, so in that sort of, fun, yeah, I mean, it's not a very direct connection that I, I can see. But uh, perhaps for small lambda or something like that, there's no more connection. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, good, good question. I, 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 it would be lovely if there was something like that. Uh, I, not, not, not that I know of the explicit connection. It's just that the modular very connection comes, na comes out naturally in the expressions for these reflection operators. Any other questions? Yeah. So I, I was just saying that uh, we can we have a pretty explicit expression now uh, for 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 these uh, reflected reflection operators. So now what we want to do is we want to use this formalism, just the, these formulas, to derive, as I as I said before, the the quantum <coughs> extremal shock that was predicted in the Engelhardt wall stuff. Okay. Uh, great. So of course, once you know what the reflect, reflection operator is, you also know what the canonical clarification is. The psi star is just R acted on these collisions. Okay. Now to see the quantum extremal shock of Engelhardt and Wall, um, you need to compute the bulk stress tensor, right? The stress tensor of the bulk magnitudes uh, in the canonically clarified state. Um, and um, for 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 this deformation to turn on some bulk stress tensor. Uh, at order lambda, since, since we are only working to linear order in perturbation theory, 
lambda, for this deformation to turn on some bulk stress tensor, uh, it's no good for, for us to take this operator over to be single trace. Right? Single trace operators don't turn on a bulk stress tensor at all the lambda. So, so you know, what you need to do is you need to take the operator over to be a double trace operator or a multi-trace operator in general. Um, but as I say here, you know, the single trace, in the single trace case, the stress, bulk stress tensor is order lambda squared. Uh, but in the double trace case, it can be order lambda. The details of what the operator O is are not going to be very important. I'm just spelling this out here because, so the double trace operator is one example of an operator that you can turn on to see a stress tensor source at order lambda, but you know, doesn't matter what that operator is, as long as it sources the bulk stress tensor at order lambda, we are good. So the details of what O is are not important, but you can take it for the moment, you can think of O as being a double trace operator. All right. So as I said, in order to proceed, we need to compute uh, the bulk stress tensor uh, in the canonical interval. Uh, so basically, this is the computation we need to do. So, so, so let's say phi is some bulk operator. We are, we are going to take the case where phi is the bulk stress tensor. Uh, but for now, let's say phi is the bulk operator whose one point function you want to compute, and you just want to evaluate the one point function in the canonically clarified state uh, as written in this expression. Now, what I'm going to do is you could, you could take this operator to be um, wherever you want. Uh, I'm going to watch. It, it, at the end of the day, I'm interested in the stress tensor of the quantum extreme surface. But I'm going to get there by taking a limit from one. So I take this the position of this bulk operator. Um, actually, for for demonstration purposes, I take it to be on on the on the L star side, namely the side where you're acting with this reflection operator, the the side which is being canonically. Uh, or the, the other side, the side that's been canonically clarified. Um, and I'm going to take the limit as this operator sort of approaches the quantum extreme. That's where I'm going to see the shock, not away from it. But that, that's how I propose to do this calculation. I start with some operator on which is on the L star side, and then I sort of take the limit as this operator approaches the quantum extreme. See, that's where the sum will be. Now, you might worry that. Uh, you, you might worry, you know, what does it even mean for this operator to lie in the entanglement wedge of L star, is in the back reaction and so on. But the back reaction in this case is order lambda times E neutral. Okay. So, so this is a sort of much smaller effect. For our purposes, we can treat the class the geometry of the bulk to be the same as the original geometry, namely the thumb of the the eternal Um But what is changing is the bulk, the, the stress tensor. The state of the bulk matter fields, and that's exactly what we are after. We are after how the bulk quantum state of matter fields changes uh, toward the lambda upon turning on this deformation. Okay, so with that preamble, uh, we, we sort of take this one point function, we compute its first derivative with respect to lambda, uh, you know, that pulls down a bunch of terms. Because the, the first two terms are whether v by d lambda is either of the reflection operators, and then the last term is where sort of the d by d lambda is the state itself, psi, because psi is also changing. Lambda, so the last term is that comes from the d by d lambda in the background state. And you know, using the flow equation that we derived for the reflection operator, we can write this in terms of these modular pair connections. Um, the last term I agree with him as the change in the one point function of this bulk operator upon introducing this boundary source. Okay. So at this point, uh, I, I have to get into some further technical details, so I apologize for the next couple of slides. Um, but hopefully, we will um, come out without the. the all our limits in that. Uh, now, so we want to take this expression and we want to evaluate it at lambda equal to zero. So, so let's let's focus on one of the terms. Let's go, you know, you have these various terms, you have three terms in particular. So let's let me focus on the first term, which is to be 
complete, we have the commutator of this modular very connection uh, with our bulk operator, and we want to evaluate that at lambda equals zero. So that's that's the expression that I want to study. Okay, and I told you that I'm going to take this operator uh, on this on the L star side. So you know, at lambda equals zero, L star is the same as R, right? Because the state is the eternal, the thermal field double state. I'm going to take the operator to be on that side, and then I'm going to take the limit as this operator approaches the quantity. Yeah. So what, what was the rule of, uh, I mean, why, why did you have to take uh, this, this lambda parameter? I mean, this shock exists also in the thermal No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because in that case, the surface is possibly exist. Possibly exist. Ah, right, because it's the same. Yes. I see. So you just, you use lambda to make the little bit. Yes, so yes, the exactly. There That's right. There. That's exactly it. Yeah. And you can do this about any other, yeah. yeah. You can do it about a more general geometry if you like. But here I'm just, for then, for your simplicity, you pick and choose. Okay. Good. Very good. So let's, let's focus on one of these ter terms. Now, because I'm taking phi to be on the right side and then you know, I'm going to take the limit as it approaches, I can rewrite this, this uh, expectation value in terms of the trace with respect to the right gradient density. Because this phi is on the right side. And now what I do is I plug in my explicit expression for the modular barrier connection. At this point, you know, the modular barrier connection had two parts. There was this part with the S integral and so on, and then there was a diagonal part. But, the, but you see at this point that the diagonal part goes away because it commutes with rho r superscript. Okay, it's diagonal on that basis. So for that reason, I can just drop the diagonal part. That is why. I've been sort of ignoring it in this discussion so far. It drops out at this stage. And we're only left with this the other part, the, the other part in terms of the, uh, which we have an explicit expression for in terms of the modular homotonic. Okay. Now, sure, sure, we have a commutator of two operators inside this trace, and then we have this integral over S. The S integral is a real time integral. Okay. Uh, you can use this real-time integral to rewrite this commutator uh, in, a, in a form uh, which is sort of nicer for our purposes. What we do is what we keep one of the terms as it is, more or less, and then the other term, we reorder the two operators by introducing an i times 2 pi in the contour. It's a pretty standard uh, trick uh, in, the language, uh, in the language of formal parameters and so on. It's essentially using the KMS position. Uh, so at this stage, what we've done is the integrands have become the same. It's just that these two terms refer by which contour you're integrating on, so which contour in the complex S plane you're integrating on. And as I said, the diagonal term is not Okay. So just just to give you a picture, what we've managed to do is we've managed to rewrite this this term that was present in the one point function of the bulk operator as a contour integral. And the integral is being done over these two blue contours. The upper blue contour minus the lower blue contour. Okay. Great. These vertical dashed lines that I've drawn in this picture are not included in this contour integration. Uh, but of course, if you want to do this contour integral by some sort of Cauchy, Cauchy like argument, you want to complete it by including these vertical. Uh, and then pick out the, so there's, I should have said that there's a pole in the strip that comes from that uh, kernel. That kernel, remember, came from the one over six squared. So you, it's very, very tempting, of course, to just complete the contour and pick out that pole. Okay. And of course, that is what you'll do. But these vertical contours, the dashed lines that you have to complete uh, this contour with, are very important. And the, this is essentially, the, the, this is where the shock is going to come from. Okay. So hold, hold, hold on to those vertical contours for now. But essentially, you know, what we have is a difference of these two horizontal blue contours. So we can write that as a sum of three terms, essentially. One coming from the pole, and the other two coming from these <coughs> vertical contours of it infinity. This is infinite real time. The pole contribution is very simple. Okay, you're just picking out the pole and that, that function. And actually what it does is it gives, you can sort of 
go through the argument in more detail uh, if you have time. Um, what it does is it gives you minus the change in the one point function from turning on the source. So, in remember in this expression, there was this, this last term here, which just came from the fact that the, the one point function of this operator in the bulk is changing because you're changing the source. But you know, the operator is on the right, okay, and the canonical purification from the left should know nothing about it. Okay? So this term had to be cancelled somehow, and the first term here precisely does that. Its job in life, at least the pole part of it, uh, the job in, job in life for that pole contribution is to cancel out this dependence on the right entanglement. If you go through a similar argument for the second term, what you find is that the second term basically replaces that contribution uh, with this the CPT contigate of the operator coming from the left. Okay. It's the same argument that I went through, this contour, contour integral argument, uh, picking out the pole and so on. So essentially what this the, the pole parts of these two terms are doing is it's throwing out all the information from the right side of the entanglement and replacing it with the CPT conjugate of the left side. Okay. That's what, of course, the Engelhardt wall description said we should do in graph. Okay. So that is great. That seems to be working out great. But what about the shock? Right? That's, we were after the quantum extreme of shock. And that's, that's where these vertical contours become crucially important. Okay? Especially, not, not always, but especially when the bulk operator that you're looking at the bulk stress tensor. Okay? Uh, it, and it particularly did that index structure. So T plus plus or T minus minus with that index structure. And particularly when this operator approaches the quantum extreme. Okay, so to, to see this, let's just write down the expression for one of these vertical contours. Let's say the vertical contour coming from S equals minus lambda. So this one. Where lambda is some very large, lambda is going on to infinity. If you just write down what that expression is, then it's very tempting to think that this is zero in the lambda going to infinity limit. Uh, you know, essentially because you think that this operator T is being boosted off to infinity. Right? There is this boost here. It's being boosted off to infinity. There is also the e to the lambda in the denominator. Looks like this thing is going to zero. So it's very tempting to just discard these vertical pieces. But one has to be a bit careful, a little bit. That, that, was, too, that was too quick, okay? The reason that was too quick is because this particular boost, the boost that appears here for the bulk stress tensor, uh, using the fact that bulk and boundary modular flows are the same, uh, you can rewrite this uh, particular boost uh, in, uh, in terms of a geometric flow in the bulk. Around the thermal field of the state, uh, this, this modular flow of the boundary is just a, a geometric boost of the boundary. Okay? So it boosts the x plus in the x plus direction and sends you boosts of the e to the s by e to the s, x minus direction e to the minus s, but importantly there is a factor of e to the 2s out. Okay? That comes from the weight, the, the plus plus weight of the object. Now, when x plus is greater than zero, of course, this operator is getting off, getting boosted off, so this correlator dies. Okay. <laughs> However, when x plus is zero, okay, this is not true because when x plus is at zero, what happens is that the e to the two s that you got from the modular wave, there's an e to the lambda, e to the s in the denominator, so the thing is blowing up. It's blowing up as e to the s, or e to the lambda. Okay. So precisely at x plus equals zero. This correlator is actually divergent. Okay? And it's not hard to extract the coefficient of the divergence. Once you know that there's a divergence, it's not hard to extract the divergence. You just integrate a little bit in an infinitesimal amount in x plus. And it's very easy to show once you know that, that this infinitesimal integral in x plus generates for you, because of this infinite boost by lambda, it generates the anecoptic, the half sided anecoptic, uh, the integral of bulk t plus plus from 0 to infinity. Which, you know, from other arguments, is known to be related to the first derivative, the first x plus derivative of 
the bug enter. <laughs> um, so that was indeed my punchline. Um, so the, the punchline is that these vertical controls uh, uh, are, are very important to keep track of. When the bulk operator has this index function of plus plus or minus minus, and when this operator is approaching the quantum extreme of this, yes? Yeah, so, so, so actually uh, I wanted to ask, uh, because you mentioned earlier, so, so, so so, so I understand the transformation rule that you have written here, yeah. precisely because of the tensor structure yeah. of, of the deep bulk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the beginning, your formalism was much more general, and at some point, you you, you claim that that whatever you were going to do would not depend on the details of the perturbation that you were turning on. So, so, so where does this T plus plus? This is an assumption on the kind of double trace deformation that no, you are considering. Or uh, so, can, can that you want to the origin surfaces, the bifurcation surfaces. Sorry. So let me let me that. So there are two things. There is this operator four, yes. which is the thing you are deforming by. Yeah. But then there is another operator five, whose one point function you are measuring. Oh, sorry. Right. right. So and this, this is what the thing whose one point function you are measuring. Yeah. Right. And O is just something that you yeah. have to put in uh -huh. so so long as it turns out. Yeah. Yeah. So. So in, yeah, exactly as you said, the details of code don't matter. Exactly. But it matters but that it you matters what you measure. measure. Exactly. Good. Yeah. All right. So that's that. So that that's where the quantum extremal shock comes from, from this point of view. And you know the same. You can repeat the same calculation. So this was done here in the specific context of the eternal black hole from a double state. Uh, but you can repeat this calculation uh, around a more general background. Uh, the essential ingredient, that is, the essential ingredient that goes into this discussion, is the fact that bulk and boundary modular flows are the same, which we believe to be true, pretty generally. And the other thing that goes into this discussion in that context is that you have you have to assume that modular flow very very close to the extremal surface is local. That is the new ingredient that you have to assume, or the new, if you like, from my perspective, mind assumption that you have to put in. To be sure that didn't bother us because in the eternal black hole, modular flow is local. Okay. So that was not an assumption in this context. In the more general context, you have to assume that uh, it's local, very close to the extremal surface. But I think that that's a well motivated assumption. And with that assumption, you can sort of push this, this same sort of argument goes around the more general state or bulk geometry. Okay? So let me summarize uh, in the last. Few minutes. So, um, um, so yes. uh, the extremal surface is null, or is it not? Uh, so yeah. So in that case, what I mean is that you have to assume that the modular flow is Euclid in Euclidean signature. So the, the, the thing that flows in Euclidean time is local, very very close to the uh, extremal surface. Yeah, in in, the, in real time it's more subtle. But thankfully, what we need to assume is that it's local in Euclidean time, Where, which is good. Which I believe is well. In real time, the modular Hamiltonian null surfaces is known, right? Uh, On null surface? Uh, but uh, this this is the modular Hamiltonian for excited states. Oh, right. What is known as the right. 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 Yeah. Okay, great. So what I tried to argue in this talk is that this reflection operator uh, is interesting and it goes beyond the standard entanglement measures in quantifying properties of states. Uh, and especially holographic states. Uh, now, in, in, in this talk, we sort of obtained a one parameter family. We, we obtained a flow equation for this reflection operator for a one parameter family of states. We sort of related it to things like modular very connections and so on. Uh, and we used a concrete application of this uh, formalism was to use it in this perturbative setup to demonstrate the existence of a quantum extremal shock that is predicted by general relativity. Uh, in this context, and as I said, I expect our arguments to sort of generalize. Even though we gave our arguments around the thermophile double state, we expect these things to generalize. These arguments to generalize uh, to more non trivial things. So I'll stop. Thank you. Yes. Buso has a paper in 2019 called Gravity Dual of the Quantum Scale yeah. Flow. Is that the one you cited? Uh, yes. yes. Right. But they, yeah. So this essentially shows what they say. They say they say that they expect the bulk <coughs> sensor to have a shock shock and this is an argument. Okay. Yeah. So 
you say this is something that I asked you earlier, which is bothering me a little bit more. Uh, this, uh, these things where you evolve with e, you know, this time shifted oh, right. e to the i h l plus h r from the bulk point of view, they're actually exactly the same, in that there's no, you know, what's different about them is how the boundary time is related to bulk time. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at, you know, definite observables in the bulk, there's no way to really distinguish them right. from the other one. Maybe this is I a think, question, yeah. I, I think that what will happen is that this one side of time, so, the reflection operator for this kind of state will yes. be conjugated <coughs> by the time operation of Yes, exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. So, this, in some sense, there's a simple way to write down the reflection operator. Right, right. But then, is there a nice bulk interpretation of this object now? Is there a nice bulk? I mean, in the bulk doesn't actually know about the difference between the thermal field state and this other state, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the bulk, uh, well, it knows. Uh, it knows. Okay. I'm not sure why you I mean it knows in terms of correlation functions. Sorry, correlation. I mean it's a question of how you set up the time in the bulk. You see, it's it's a question of how the bulk time is related to the boundary time. Yes. But if I just uh, uh, you know it's still true that if in the bulk I start at one point and I and I, I go down, I'll get the right correlators. It's true that the bulk time that you call T in one case is T plus tau. But like in the bulk there's no different variant observable you could think of. You could think of observables rest to both boundaries. Yes, right? yes, that's right. There's no like different variant object in the bulk that differentiates these two states. Uh, well, what you know? What about like lengths of J plus six? Well, that, I guess it's addressed to something on the boundary. Yeah, 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 that's true. So, so I guess that's the maybe those are the only things. Uh, those are those enter in correlators, right? Inside the correlators. If you address them to the boundary, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's true. Uh, uh, yeah, I just mean that if you, if you just look at the full bulk metric, it's exactly the same in both cases. Uh, sure. The full, sure. full sure. bulk metric yes. and everything yes. is just exactly the same. And you can just, I see, and, and maybe that doesn't matter. So, in this. Yeah, yeah no, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, okay. I haven't yeah. exactly yeah. thought about this case, but okay. I'd love to talk about it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe this is for later and because it's, it's very vague, but, but since there are no questions right now, so, 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 so. so since you have a formalism that in certain situations allows, uh, allows you to actually prove what's happening uh, in, in the bulk uh, at the level of uh, actually computing what, what the flow of this uh, model of 100 times is doing, uh, could, could this give you some, some handle at the bulk level uh, to, to identify the potential uh, Presence of singularities in the future by analyzing the behavior of the stress tensor is, as a function of time of your perturbation. Right, right. That's a great question. Um, because you know, I, I, you, you've mentioned Busso, so, so Busso has this this this, 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 this idea. I mean, so some some sort of quantum version of the pencil of singularities, uh, saying yeah. that whenever whenever you have some perturbation that he calls hyperentropic, then the the the, the the way in which the bulk, uh, bulk reacts is by generating a singularity. So, so it's formulated in some sort of semi-classical, but it seems that you, you, your technology here, uh, as you said, you were able to prove some previous claim by, by, right. by right. So, so I'm wondering, uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> yeah, I know, I know, make, but, but, yeah, but, I, but it sounds that your technology perhaps yeah. could, could, could be used. In yeah, I haven't thought about it at all, but yeah, yeah I'd love to chat more. Uh, give me one two, comment two, I'll two. make is that, uh, you know, the Engelbart wall prescription tells you explicitly the geometry on, in the two wedges, but the future and past of the two wedges, it's sort of just, you know, it's homework. It's agnostic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you just know what you call it. But this formalism allows you to do that from this, you can just explicitly compute from the CFT side what's happening in the, these two regions. Okay. Right? Yeah. So in that sense, uh, it sort of, yeah, it gives you some way of drawing beyond okay. uh, the, the, the shaft. Uh, but yes, I, I'd love to chat more. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm being very very No, 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 no very chat later. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to chat. Okay, thanks.